Yeah. Next, uh, on Wednesday, and now you already be online because the exam starts at exactly five o'clock. What that means is you better be at Marshak room MR3 before that because you have to be seated. And there has to be some arrangement where, you know, there is space, spatial distancing and people have to sit in a column so that you don't easily see what anybody else is doing in front of you in the row and so on. So you have to be ready because the exam starts at precisely five o'clock. I will tell the proctors. Somebody had a question. Oh, are they assigned seats? Uh, no, at least I'm not sophisticated enough to remember which seat number where and so on. So it would have to be by some way that the proctor will have to arrange and make sure that you are all properly separated. All right. So be there. I would tell the proctors to be there 10 minutes before to allow for times to shuffle here, shuffle there. OK, because the exam will start exactly at 5 p.m. computer time. And you will have 75 minutes. OK, and we will have some, I guess, a little bit of a review by uh, later, we around 6.10 or so, or 6.15, we will start a little bit of a review, OK? All right? Any questions for now? OK, now, we have been on chapter 21, even though it will not be on this test number one, but we still have to go because we have to cover all of these chapters for 204. And But it will certainly be on the next test, test number two. So do not think that whatever we cover here is something that you can just ignore. All right, somebody had a question. What was the question? I can't read too well. There, is there any review today? Yeah, later, uh, around uh, 6, 10, 6, 15, we'll uh, do a little bit of a review. OK? Yeah. All okay. right. So now I want to get back to the key concept in magnetism. And that is, you remember with Coulomb's law, if you have a charge, a point charge, it will be the source of electric field. So you say, if I have a source, there will be an electric field, and the electric field go, points radially away from a point charge. And in fact, that's what you will be tested on, you know, for uh, on Wednesday. What is the electric field? What's the strength and so on? So we know for electricity, for electric field, for electric force, you have separated Coulomb's law into two parts where you say, first, the source charge is a source of electric field and it points radially and it decreases, like, the electric, like uh, Newton's law, decreases inverse square law. So you have the electric field which is very intense when you're close to this source charge, point charge, and it goes down like 1 over r squared. And the proportionality constant is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, which we sometimes, this book calls it k. It's a constant. It's 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 in the international unit, SI unit. All right, so you now say, I now know that this point charge 
is the origin, is the source of electric field that radiates out. And then the question is, you are passing by or you are somewhere out in space and you have your own charge, call it the observer charge, Q0, Q observer. You are the observer and you have a charge, then you will feel a force. That is Coulomb's law. You will feel a force which depends on your charge, Q0, you of the observer, times the magnitude of the electric field at your position. So here I am, I have produced electric field. My source is 10 coulombs. I somehow was able to build up a charge that was, uh, you know, very strong, 10 coulombs. Then my electric field you know, is pointed at you. And you may be a meter away, I don't know, half a meter, wherever you are, or actually now you're more than a meter away. You are very, very far away. Anyway, you will feel a force due to the electric field that comes from my source. And your force that you feel is Q sub zero times E, the magnitude of the electric field due to me. And that is one over R squared. So that is how you re, you where you get back the Coulomb's law. You have taken Coulomb's law and you have separated into an intermediate concept, which is electric field. And then that electric field now is the one that causes you to have a force on you. Now for magnetism, we no longer deal with a point charged by itself. We're dealing with a current, like I have a rod, which carries a current, and it carries a current I. Now, in magnetism, we now also introduce this concept of, hey, if I have a current flowing with uh, this electric current, which can be one coulomb per second passing by in my rod, which means one amp. If I have a current flowing, whatever is the amp, amperage, then it is a source of magnetic field. There will be magnetic field around this. There will be magnetic field around this wire. Now we say it's a wire now, there has to be a wire. If there's no wire, I have no current. If I did not connect a, a, a wire between this end and that end, there would have been no current. If there's no current, there's no magnetic field due to this wire. All right, so now we say, I want to now, just like in the description of the electric field, the electric force of attraction or repulsion, I now want to introduce a language that is analogous to that. And I say, if I have a current, a wire that carries a current I, there will then be a magnetic field due to it. And that magnetic field now is by the right hand rule. The book calls it right hand rule number two. Whatever you want to call it, it's now there's a magnetic field due to this particular current I. All right. So this now is the key concept that we now want to introduce in this chapter. So if I have this wire and it carries a current I, it will produce magnetic fields. And now the magnetic fields, the intensity of that magnetic field or the strength of that magnetic field will vary depending on how far away you are from this wire. Just like the intensity of the electric field. Oh, it depends on how far away you are from me. It's one over four pi epsilon zero, one over R squared, inverse square law, the electric field, the strength of the electric field. Well, here we now say the magnetic field due to this wire, the magnetic field that is produced by this wire 
I don't know and I don't care. There may be other magnetic field due to the Earth. There may be magnetic field due to uh, a high transmission power line that has a magnetic field around it and so on. Those are extra. The one that is due to this fire that I have in my room here, well, that is now mu zero over two pi I over R. I being the strength of your current. And then now we have a new constant, which we will call permeability. And this constant in these system international units, the engineering units, is in these units, it's Terra Tesla, not Terra. <laughs> Tesla, because the magnetic field, they call it in terms of Tesla, meter per amp, right? Because this has to be in Tesla units. This is in amp. This is in meters. So therefore, it is Tesla meter per amp. And it is 4 pi times 10 to minus 7. It's a number, a constant. And it's called the permeability of free space. We are not having what you call uh, ma magnetic materials between this uh, current and where we are measuring it. There can be what they call ferromagnet, diamagnet, and so on. Just like for the electric field capacitors, you can have dielectric instead of empty space. So there will be a dielectric constant and there will be a permeability constant for a ferromagnetic, diamagnetic material. In which case, then the mu is not mu zero. It is whatever is the permeability of that material. But for the moment, we just simply say, I don't want to yet introduce all these other complications. Let it be an empty space. And all I have is this... Uh, wire that carries a certain current I, then it will produce this magnetic field. All right, so I put this in terms of a certain shade here so that we know this is a formula that you'll be using in whatever applications later in this chapter. All right, I think we went over this okay already last week, but this is a good thing to kind of remind ourselves because it's a key concept. We need to grasp that concept. And now we look at now the com question. You remember we said for Coulomb law, first you tell me you have a source, it produced a certain electric field. And then the question was, I am an observer. I, you know, have a certain Q0, observer charge Q0. What is the force on me? And then Coulomb says, yeah, I have measured it. And I, I know for sure it is dependent on how much is your observer charge Q0 times the strength of this E. Well, here we would like to know what is the force that this wire will produce on a observer? that happens to be a cosmic ray, that happens to be, I don't know, some other, uh, you know, things that are uh, uh, given off somewhere. And it happens to pass by. So now I have my current, my wire in the current, and some, I wouldn't call it nosy Parker, but, you know, some uh, curious, uh, you know, uh, yeah, maybe call it Nosy Parker, was uh, coming by into my room and I have a wire and uh, this uh, Nosy Parker came by. Now this Nosy Parker had a certain charge, Q0, and it came by, let's say for this diagram, up parallel to my uh, wire, right? So this, here is your wire and this uh, Nosy Parker was just flying by you know, parallel. So here is my wire. Let's say this is my wire. 
All right, so let's say this is my wire. Can you see the wire? Yeah, you can see the wire. And now I'm passing by. But now when I'm passing by, there is now a force on me. There's a force on me according to this, what we call the Lorentz force. And you remember the formula? It is Q, whatever is your Q, which happens to be Q observer, V cross B. This is the law or the Lorentz force, the force on a charged particle going through a magnetic field. This magnetic field is due to this wire, but whatever is the magnetic field, there will be a force on my nosy Parker. I am flying by. When I'm flying by, there is now a force on me. But this force on me is a curious force. It makes me go funny. It's not like electric field. Oh, you are uh, directed at me and I'm positive charge. Oh, man, I will be pushed away. I, I hate you because you are smelly. You know, you, are, you, have, you, you have a certain plus charge and I have a plus charge. Oh, I am uh, repelled by you. But if, let's say, I'm negative charge and you are positive charge, your electric field, oh, I am attracted to you. But for this magnetic field, I happen to be charge Q0, a positive charge. But now, because I'm going upward, V cross B, if you do the right-hand rule, V cross B gives me a force that is towards this wire. What that means? That means that I become trapped in a circle. I become trapped. When I'm a nosy parker passing by your wire, I thought I was whistling and singing to myself, I thought I could just simply say, hi, bye-bye, you know. But instead, what happens is, I come by, your magnetic field will trap me. And it will trap me, according to this Lorentz force, it will trap me V cross B. And now V cross B, when you look at the diagram there, V cross B gives me a force towards the wire. And so I'll be trapped around it. A current exerts a magnetic force on a moving charge. So now they say, well, what happens if you have a long straight wire carrying a con current of 3 amps? That means 3 coulombs per second. A particle has a charge of 6.5 micro coulomb and is moving parallel to the wire at a distance of 0 0.05 meters. That means you know R is 0 0.05. And the speed of the particle is 280 meters per second. So it's actually flying by quite fast. Now they say, what is the magnitude and direction of the magnetic force? Well, so the book has two slides. So anyway, we. so now you just use this formula and you say, it depends on the angle V between V and B, if you are indeed exactly perpendicular to the plane, and this is the magnetic field, then theta is 90 degrees. But the important thing is B is mu zero I over two pi R. The magnitude of the magnetic field around this wire is mu zero I over two pi R. But the force on this charge is according to the Lorentz force law, is Q, your charge, Q0, V times this magnetic field. And you can now work it out. V is mu zero I over two pi R. And you can work out what the number is, depending on what the, the number they give you. All right, you can work it out. Any questions so far? I mean, I'm quickly reviewing what we have already learned towards the end of last Wednesday. Okay, all right, so now, yeah, so far, no. I mean, you can, you should always interrupt me because otherwise I'm just talking to myself. 
All right. Now, now that we have gotten this concept that a wire carries with it a magnetic field, question now you can say is, what if I have two wires? You see, you're sort of beginning to be uh, building a whole new language. And the kind of language that you will be sort of discussing is, you already, I learned and I appreciate the fact that if I have a wire, there will be a magnetic field due to this wire, and this magnetic field will be according to this uh, right-hand rule, that it will be according to what my fingers would be with my thumb, right? So I know due to this wire, and the current is flowing which way? The current is flowing outward. You see the arrow? The current is flowing this way. And so the magnetic field due to wire one is upward. Right? Do you see it? But now I happen to have a wire that carries a current also. And now what happens? Will there now be a force on this wire due to this wire? Are you following the, the question? I already understand and I know that given this wire and that there's a current in this wire, there will be a magnetic field due to this wire and it is this B. This B now is due to one. All right. And now if this wire one produces magnetic field this way, and my wire, and now in my uh, neighbor wire, I have a wire neighbor wire, right? A parallel wire, and it is also going in the same direction. What happens? Well, oh, I didn't, I, sh I, I thought I have. You remember there's this law which says that the force is now I L cross B. It really is QV cross B. In other words, the wire here has a lot of these currents that are uh, charges that are now going in the same direction. So there is a V QV, namely the wire two carries all these charges that are moving in the same direction as this wire current. And so there is V and V cross B, which way is V? Yeah, okay. V in here was going the other way. And because of that, V cross B would now be a force away. Therefore, there's repulsion. Do you, you see the, the result? Here, the wire is coming this way. In this wire, the current is going that way. There is a magnetic field due to this wire, the current in this wire, and the magnetic field due to this current in this wire flowing in this direction is a magnetic field upward over here. But in this wire, my charges are all going in this direction. And because my charges are going in this direction, V cross B is this way. What does that mean? That means that these two wires repel each other. So two wires with, with current flowing opposite direction repel. But two wires that in fact have the same direction, I don't know, this one is in the same direction, okay? So it's in the same direction, then the magnetic field due to this is upward. But now here, the current is flowing this way and V cross B, if you use the right hand rule, the Lorentz law, V cross B gives you a force towards this wire. Therefore, when you have now the wires carrying with uh, the same direction, they are trapped. All right, so this then is now beginning to produce a broader perspective that you can now put wires together and depending on whether they are in the same direction or in opposite direction, 
it would be like as if the electric field you can have attractive and repulsive now you have like a magnet and the magnet two magnets you can have repulsive and attractive depending on your uh, north south pole and if you now look at it in terms of the magnetic lines of uh, field lines if this one is going up the magnetic field lines are all this way and if this one is also up the magnetic field lines are this way and then you can see that the net magnetic field when you have a magnetic field line here and a magnetic field line here over here the magnetic field lines are in uh, counterclockwise whereas over here it is also counterclockwise and they cancel that's why they attract uh, can you see this uh, I, can you uh, it would be hard for me to yeah and in the repulsion one goes clockwise and the other go uh, uh, counterclockwise right yeah when this is now upward it causes the magnetic field over here to be directed this way and now because this is down it also is this way and so it becomes too crowded they don't they don't cancel each other and when they are too crowded they repel whereas here since they cancel each other oh man then it's easy for them to get together did you see you have yeah this particular picture doesn't show the arrow on the individual magnetic field lines if it did it would be easier to understand but we have to work with whatever they give us with the slides you you get the picture don't you right yeah okay good actually Wiley they since they make such a lot of money they should actually do hire somebody to put in more arrows you know so that you get a sense of the direction anyway okay now let's work on a conceptual example the net force that a current carrying wire exerts on a current carrying coil all right namely a wire and a coil okay so here I have a wire it has already a current flowing it in it from whatever terminal I have a battery so I have a current flowing here and then I have now a coil and this coil also has a current flowing through it uh, it is because uh, you know underneath this coil I have a, uh, a a battery and so it supplies a current that goes here and here all right so it basically think of it as there's a terminal here and the terminal produces a current in this part and now this is the uh, down there and then it comes back up and produces the current this way in other words that's why they call it segment namely you have already produced a coil such that you have it connected and connected it wired in such a way that you have the current flowing like as if in a loop uh, are you okay with this I mean that's what the the engineers the uh, people who do these DC motors that the people who do all these uh, gadgets that's what they do they are paid to do that yeah such that it supplies a current through this part of the loop in this direction and then the current through this part of the loop now so as it is like going in a complete loop so you call it a current coil carrying coil okay are you comfortable with this picture now it's a gadget but they just want us to kind of 
think through because we are not engineers what we want to know is what in principle is the concept that's involved and what would be the expectation well okay so then we say yeah but i know is the coil attracted to or repelled by the wire but i know oops ah i know that due to this guy which we call i1 after all this has a current and this current need not be exactly the same as this current so we call this i1 due to this i1 there is a magnetic field over here at the distance of little r due to on this arm of the coil due to the same wire i1 there is a magnetic field further away on this other arm of the coil and it's further away so we use a, uh, a capital r notation all right in other words we are beginning to make use of what we have learned what we have learned is due to any wire it will have its magnetic field and its magnetic field strength is mu zero i whether in this case is i1 over 2 pi little r over here and 2 pi capital r over here namely the magnetic field strength is stronger here than here uh, you get the concept now because you on this arm of the current coil it is further away from this wire than this yes yeah right i mean that's what you call getting the concept right we can see yeah, sure, I already learned about this uh, B is uh, mu zero I over two pi R. So since this R is closer, it's stronger than here. But now I also know that there's a force on this arm here that is whatever is its current and the length, whatever is the length L, cross B. So I now remember that B is mu zero I over two pi R. And now let me work out. What is this force on this arm? The force of this arm depends on whatever is your current, but you told me that current is I2, so I say it's I2. And whatever is the length L, and this I will call it L because that's just the length of your coil times the magnitude of the magnetic field due to you. The magnetic field is your fault. The magnetic field, there would have been no magnetic field if you had turned off the current. But since you have an I1, ooh, then uh, you know there has to be a uh, magnetic field, which is mu zero I over two pi R. So it is two pi little R, right? But now, how about over here? Over here, oh, I call this Fu for the upper arm. Yes, I, I, I put this upper arm Fu. And now this is the lower arm I put down. I, I didn't know whether it would have helped to call it Fl. But anyway, the lower, the down, the, the, the other part, right? The further away. Now it is the same current I2 because you arranged this gadget so that it was as if it was a current flowing through the whole loop, but actually it is not. It's a clever way of arranging it, such that this has still the same current flowing, and it's the same length, L, but now its magnetic field strength is smaller. Why is it smaller? Because R is bigger than your little r. If this capital R is bigger than your little r, Therefore, FD is less than FU, right? The force is less. But now, which direction is the force? 
well, we should have, uh, I already let the cat out of the bag. Since the current is flowing this way, and the magnetic field due to this wire, the magnetic field direction is into the board, then I B is now a force upward. Uh, is that clear? This is my direction I, and the magnetic field due to this is into the board because that's this, the magnetic field is always, you know, around the thumb and the thumb is in the direction of the current I1. So the magnetic field is into the board. And if this is now your I2, I2 cross B is now upward. So the force on this arm of the coil, on this arm, ARM, on this arm of the coil is upward. How about over here? Which direction is the force on this arm of the coil due to the magnetic field that is due to this? Is it also upward or downward? Do you see what this is now? The magnetic field due to this wire is still into the board because it's come from the same wire. It's into the board, but now it is, the current here is flowing in this direction. So therefore, I cross B, which way is the force now? Which direction is the force, FD? Can you wave your arm? Can you use your thumb, use your right hand? Huh? Can somebody help me? Do you have your right hand? You, huh? Is it upward or downward now? Which way? The magnetic field due to this wire over here is into the board because you use your uh, your uh, right hand rule number two it's into the board but now over here just like over here it is into the board but over here the current is flowing in this direction not in that direction so which way is the force on this arm the current i is in opposite direction here so is it still upward or is it now going to be downward? Huh? Downward. All right. You, you have to <laughs> be very good with your right hand and refer to this all the time. Here, I is opposite. B continues to be Due to this wire, B continues to be down into the board. So therefore now the force is downward. But you notice, I make this arrow a little smaller than this arrow. Why? Because this arrow has a bigger strength. Since this R is smaller, this arrow is bigger upward and this force down here is smaller downward. Are you following the, the concept here? We didn't put in the numbers, but we can kind of now sense the magnitude of the magnetic field due to this wire I1 is smaller. It's less strong. Therefore, the force downward due to the fact that your current is in the opposite direction, therefore the force downward is less. Yes? Are you okay with this concept? Therefore, is there a net force? You know, this is 203, right? Is this now 203? You have an upward force, you know, uh, let's say it is, uh, you know, 35 newtons. And down here it says, ooh, I only have, uh, you know, 10 newtons. Why? Because uh, this R is so much bigger. I have 35 newtons upward, 10 newtons downward. So which way is the net force? 
upward. Right? Do you follow? Are you okay with this now? You see, therefore, therefore, without getting into the actual numbers, you can say, when I have a current flowing through a wire and I put a coil underneath it, my coil can be attracted by it. If I put my current in the right way, it can be attracted by it. Or if I reverse the current, it could be repelled by it. And so I could play games with it. Meaning that my engineer, you know, down here, who is controlling the, the way the, the, this coil carries the current, or he could be having a nice uh, tick-tock, you know, tick-tock, tick-tock. And so what happens is it gets attracted, repel, attracted, repel, attracted, repel, according to whatever music you play. Uh, you sort of at least get the right feeling for what this conceptual example is asking. I mean, these are numbers which uh, engineers would have to work it out, but what we are doing is not engineering. What we want to do is just to get uh, some enjoyment out of it, right? To say that, hey, I am able to, in fact, have this current coil, uh, carrying coil to move either up or down, up or down, depending on the direction of my wire, I mean, my current in my wire, in my wire, in my coil. Now, incidentally, did you notice I did not even look at over here? But I don't need to. Why? Because over here, this current is upward. Over here, this current is downward. And every point on opposite arm, on opposite side of the arm, have the same strength of distance from the wire. Therefore, the force cancels against this force. The force cancels against this force. Therefore, these side arms don't contribute to any net force. Only these opposite arm, upper and lower arm, they will have an effect on what happens. Are you comfortable with that? Because after all, over here, it is directed upward, but it's the same current directed downward, and they are all, both sides have the same distance from the, uh, from this primary color, uh, uh, wire. Are you uh, following that? Are we now comfortable with this example? We can go on. Okay, no objections, so let's go on. Now, this is now getting more, uh, let's say, interesting. I now have a loop of wire. You see, I'm getting more and more, you know, engineering is coming to make uh, more gadgets. And now uh, what I want to do is to now say, I now have a loop of wire, not a, a uh, straight wire. I want to make a loop. And now this loop will produce a magnetic field through this loop. Because if I look at this loop individually, it's sort of like I have a wire and I have a current, I have a current, I have a current, I have a current. And this wire carrying current will produce a magnetic field. But now by this loop is in fact this wire that's been bent around. You know, these engineers are not satisfied to have a straight wire, right? Oh, they are like little kids. They want to make uh, things out of it. You can make a coil out of it. You can make uh, a, a solenoid out of it. You know, later on, we'll talk about a solenoid. Namely, you coil it and you go 1500 turns, you know, to make a big solenoid. So the engineers now say, now that you have taught me that uh, a wire, a straight wire, a straight wire will produce a uh, current 
a straight wire of we carrying I will produce a magnetic field of this strength and it will be around this wire. I will now make a wire loop. I want to now feed a current through this loop and the engineer says it's very easy. You just bend the wire and connect to the same you know, battery. And this, it's the battery that determines what's the current. The battery depends on what is the voltage that you have, 10 volts, 15 volts, 8 volts, 4 volts, whatever. I connect this wire in a loop to this, and therefore there will be a current flowing through. And now I would like to know, will there not be a magnetic field? But of course, right? there will continue to be a magnetic field. There will continue to be a magnetic field through this because my each segment of the loop produces a magnetic field. And they are all in the same direction. And for this case, where it is a loop of wire loop that is... Uh, Let's say this one is uh, on top of the page and this one is under the page. So therefore, there is a magnetic field. The way they have it, it's a magnetic field that is to the side. Why? Because you, you put your thumb in the direction of the current. And if you put your thumb in the direction of the current, then your fingers will be pointing in this direction of the magnetic field. So with this current loop, with this wire loop, which is now a current loop, with this current loop, it will produce a magnetic field and the magnetic field will now be going this way. The magnetic field is trying to hug this loop and it will go out and it will hug and come back. It will hug and come back. It will go out and come back. It will go out and come back. It will go out and come back. That's like what a magnet does. And now the strength of the magnetic field depends on the radius of this. You leave it to the engineers to have figured it out, but you leave it to the engineers. They have figured it out that it is now mu zero I over two R. The reason why the the pi, one factor of pi is went out. It has to do with the fact that this length of the wire is 2 pi r. Anyway, you, you, you don't worry about the, it's the engineers who have fig figured it out. And now, so the formula for a wire loop of radius r carrying a current i is mu zero i over 2 r. But the key concept here is that you are now able to make something like a mag magnet. And the magnet that you have, equivalent magnet that you have now produced by this wire loop is a magnet where the North Pole is on this side, South Pole is on this side. Do you, do you see it? Because the magnetic field comes out from the North Pole and ooh, wraps around to the South Pole end. So this then is now the formula that the engineers will be using. And they are very interested in using this. The reason is they can now make the strong magnetic field they can make a strong magnetic field by having small coils. They make the R small and for a given I, oh, then your, uh, your magnetic field is stronger. From the engineering point of view, the only unfortunate thing is mu zero is small. You remember mu zero was 10 to the minus uh, something in these uh, engineering units. So, it, they are not able to make this into a, uh, a Tesla in terms of the magnetic field unless they are able to make this 
loop so small and then they increase the wire current but anyway leave it to the engineers they they uh, they they struggle with all of these applications but for us we just say yeah i can understand i can understand that when you have a loop of wire you can make something look like a magnet and the magnetic field that comes from this magnet oh you can actually calculate all right any questions about this any questions about this okay now let us now it's sort of uh, interesting in a certain way engineers are never satisfied with what they have already discovered because they want to invent new gadgets and now what they are saying here in this example is i have a wire a long straight wire uh, they, we have not yet made a solenoid and we'll come to a solenoid so they are still playing you know like kids a lego block you know you want to make uh, this you want to make that so they they have two things two toys to play with one toy is a wire a rod a wire a long straight wire and then the other one is a coil because we already learned that engineers can easily make a coil no big deal it's not something like uh, uh, as I said the last time if I have a ruler I, I cannot bend it you know uh, uh, if I have a ruler I cannot bend it because if I bend it it breaks but a wire oh you can bend it you know these uh, Verizon when they install their files oh they have all these wires and their wires have uh, you know they can coil it around and so on so I have a straight wire it carries a current I1. I have a coil. It carries current I2. And now they say, what is the net magnetic field? Because you know that this will produce a magnetic field. But you also know from the previous slide that this coil also produces magnetic field. And naturally, you would like to know, oh, what would be the net? Is the net magnetic field bigger, smaller? How do I have fun with it? All right. So they now say, oh, I want to have an example. I have a long straight wire carrying current of 8 amps and a circular loop of wire carrying a current 2 amps. And it has a radius of 0.03 meters. Remember the magnetic field due to a wire loop is, uh, you know, dependent on the radius of this uh, of this loop. Now they say, what is the magnitude and direction of the magnetic field at the center of the loop? Namely, now they say, whoo! Originally, I knew what was the magnetic field due to my uh, loop, but now you came along, you nosy Parker you want to make me mad or you want to i don't know make me not so mad whatever you brought your magnetic field into my magnetic field there was a magnetic field and this one is uh, is uh, the magnetic field of this c is down into that's why it's down the way it is you use the the right hand rule when the current i2 the magnetic field due to this i2 is down is down all right and you know because you 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 put your thumb in the direction of this current and it is down b2 but now you mess me up you brought your wire near me but you will produce a magnetic field the way this current is it is now upward at here 
the magnetic field due to this wire I1 is upward. You call it B1. And now they want to know what's the net magnetic field? Well, because your magnetic field is upward and my original magnetic field is downward, you make the net magnetic field less. Now, if I were an engineer and I wanted this much uh, you know, magnetic field, you came by, you made me less strong in magnetic field. And then I would suddenly not be able to tell my boss that, uh, you know, my boss says I should produce a magnetic field of uh, so many uh, Tesla, but because of you, you know, you disturb, and you disturb my magnetic field so that you now decrease my magnetic field and my boss is going to hammer me on the head, right? This is then an example of you had your design, you already know the magnetic field here should have been mu zero I two over mu zero I two over two R, whatever is your R, but now it is less because of you. How much less? I guess they work it out here. You can now say, I know the magnetic field due to one, ah, it is mu zero I one over two pi R. That was the original formula for a wire by itself, a straight wire. But when you now ask what is the net magnetic field in the center of my wire loop, well, that I already know it is mu zero I two over two R. There's no pi. It is the pi is missing because of the fact that it's now a circle. Well, the net now is I1 over pi R minus I2 over R. The factor is mu zero over two. And voila, you put in the numbers, the in these units, the mu zero happens to be very small. Mu zero happens to be very small. And then by the time you work it out, the my magnetic field that I have in my wire loop, the magnetic field that I have in my, the actual magnetic field that I have in my wire loop is now smaller. It is now smaller. And my boss is not going to pay me. And so I guess I should be mad, no? But you get this, the, the, the concept now. Do you get the concept? Right? So it is, you begin to see also the power, you know, I mean the, uh, the perspective that if you have a wire by itself, it will produce magnetic field. And I know it is mu zero I, whatever is your current, divided by two pi R, little r, whatever the distance from the wire. But now that you have invented a loop, wire loop, and you have invented a wire loop of a certain radius, capital R, then you will say, ha ha, with my invention, I will have a magnetic field that is mu zero, the current through my loop over two R. But now when you have the two together, I can be in trouble unless you came along and you say, well, actually what I did is I didn't put my wire current this way. I flip it around. If I flip it around, I'm actually helping you. If I flip this current around, I actually will be helping you. And then you'll be able to say, oh yeah, thank you. That's the little improvement in making my uh, coil more effective and desirable for whatever function or use that my boss wanted it for, right? So this is very important for engineers to know. And what we just want to follow along is to say, yeah, I can see what is happening, but the details, I leave it to you engineers, but at least I know what is happening. Do you know what's happening?
or you are uh, in a daze, so you don't know what's happening. Huh? Any comments? Any comments? All right, let's go on. Okay, now, here, we already have the wire loop and it produced a magnetic field and we say that now the magnetic field due to wire loop is the same as the magnetic field due to a pole and so a, you know a, a magnet and so we now can say that the field lines around the bar magnet resemble those around the loop and instead of a wire loop if i take the magnet with north pole and south pole it would have produced this therefore i now have produced an artificial magnet i have produced an artificial magnet now what's the difference a magnet is actually sort of like a permanent magnet a magnet that you uh, you got from uh, a mine you know, you had to dig for it, you know, right? And you got that magnet. That magnet is a, like a property of the molecules that are inside. It's what they call a ferromagnet or, or a paramagnet. It is a magnet. It's, it's a uh, permanent magnet. And you cannot do much to do to, to play with it. You, you get a magnet that already has a certain strength. But me, I'm a good engineer. I say, I can now produce the magnetic field of a magnet, but that magnetic strength is up to me. I increase my uh, current. I now go from, uh, you know, uh, so many uh, Tesla, you know, let's say, well, in the old units, it's Gauss. Uh, for the uh, magnetic field near the uh, Earth's surface, it's a third of a Gauss. Now, instead of a third of a Gauss, I can have a magnet that is now 10 Gauss, 25 Gauss. All I do is I increase my current. I increase my current in this wire loop. Now I have as if it is a magnet of 10 Gauss. I increase it some more. It's like it is now a magnet of 50 Gauss, 100 Gauss. You, you see now the difference? Over here, you are at the, I guess, that's all you were able to. You mined it from some uh, uh, mountain somewhere, and these are the magnets that you have. And that's fixed for you. Here, you now have an advance in technology. You are now able to produce artificial magnets. And these depend on the current that you have in the wire. And later, we want to say, well, how do I make this even stronger? What you do is you now have more coils. Instead of one coil, you now have two, three, four, five. Now each coil with the current in the same direction, it will produce a magnetic field. And if I now have a hundred coils, I have a thousand coils, oh, then the particular magnetic field that is produced by this solenoid, oh, would be what I can use. I don't have to now uh, look for these uh, mining companies and say, hey, uh, have you been able to find, uh, you know, natural magnets uh, that are uh, of this uh, strength or of that strength? You don't have to. You manufacture your own. You, you see now the progress of uh, technology. All right. Okay. So here, oh, just to uh, uh, emphasize the property of this wire loop. If I have a wire loop such that this is the wire in this direction and the magnetic field is all coming out 
this way and then I put another wire loop of exactly the same orientation of current then the magnetic field line would be this way and I have magnetic field line that are this way and the magnetic field line that are this way what happens the magnetic field line over here is this direction the magnetic field line over here is in this direction and they cancel over here so they attract each other but if I were to have my wire one of them is in this direction so that the is the magnetic north pole on this side and now I have magnetic south pole on this side because I have my wire current going in the opposite direction then there is repulsion so it is I can now reproduce all of those effects of magnets with wire loops are you okay with this okay all right so now we come to solenoid do you remember who was the guy who invented solenoid well your memory is not as good as I thought you would be we had introduced this uh, was it Ampere was it Ampere who invented solenoid well you can look it up in in, in, uh, in an earlier slide well, anyway so here is now a, a natural thing that you now say since I am able to have the magnetic field due to a wire loop and if I have one loop it produces magnetic field with as if it is the magnet with the North Pole on this side why don't I have now hundred hundred of them because you know I have a wire the wire is doing that it can easily be coiled around right so all I need to do is to have something in the middle and I wrap this wire around it of course the engineers will have to figure out what I should put in between and you know leave it to the engineers to now say oh you know it's a I, I don't even know I'm not an engineer it's not a piece of uh, banana and a coil around the banana but you know you wrap a coil around something uh, some kind of material but I, I leave it to the engineer I, I, I only know how to eat a banana but not uh, how to make a solenoid but the point is I want to wrap around this wire and round and round and round and round and round right I want to wrap so many of them around and then they will all have the current flowing in the same direction you know because it went around and came up it went around came back went around came back went around came back so now I have gazillion a certain number and I now have let's say all the current all the coils now will have the current coming out and going in 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 and they will now add to the effective magnetic field because due to one such loop already it is mu zero i over 2r but now you have 15 20 100 so therefore my effective magnetic field is now depending on the number of turns are you following me on this yes because solenoid is very common it's a very useful tool it is sort of like one of the the foundations of many of the uh, engineering ap applications well so now you say therefore the magnetic uh, the field due to each one 
is now if i have just one it would have been mu zero i over two pi r but now i have n of them and this number n is the number of turns per unit length two pi r number of turns per unit length and therefore the formula for the effective magnetic field now is mu zero n i where n now means the number of turns per unit length if i have let's say a hundred turns per unit length then my magnetic field effective magnetic field now is 100 times times i mu zero i uh, don't worry about these factors of two and factors of pi the engineers they figure it out for you but what we need to learn is that my effective magnetic field in the presence of a solenoid now is dependent on how many turns i have per unit length and clearly the more turns i have per unit length the bigger is the magnetic field and so it is by this that i actually overcome this mu zero being so small mu zero being so small no big deal i mean it is a big deal but uh, for engineers now they are able to and they now make n big and of course they also make the current big all right and that's how you're able to get uh, you know this magnetic fields not quite a tesla but enough for many applications well this is for engineers Uh, maybe I will stop now for, from the, this MPS law. We will continue on Wednesday uh, after the test. All right. Okay. Is there agreement or disagreement? Okay. All right. So now let me say once again, you better be already at MR3 before five o'clock. And I will ask the proctors to be there 10 minutes before. I know the room is available already 10 minutes before MR3. So first, of course, you have to be there. And now the other thing I have found, because I checked since there were some that asked for it, can you borrow a laptop from uh, the library? And the answer is, sorry, no, 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 no. You bring your own laptop. Then there was the other question. Oh, room is Marshak room MR3. Uh, if you don't know where is MR3, you better uh, go to Marshak and they say, hey, where is MR3? It is on the right hand end of Marshak building. MR1, MR2 is the biology. Uh, yeah, it's the biology. And then MR3 is the physics side. Uh, MR1 and 2, I think, maybe. Yeah. I think. But anyway, I know. MR3. So you better be at MR3 10 minutes before, and I will ask my uh, proctors. There will be two of them. It is uh, Gabriel Legendre and uh, oh, what's the other one? Eskil Anderson. Namely, your GH and GH3 uh, lab instructors. They will be there 10 minutes before, and you will then have to go in, and they will have to somehow arrange you for you to be in columns. You know, like uh, you all are in one column so that you sit 
a separate row from me. There's a row separating you to the one in front of you so that you cannot see what the guy has in front of you with his uh, laptop, with his things, all right? So you have to be in a column and then you have to be separated by at least one seat, you know, and then, so it has to be arranged and the room is big enough to accommodate. There are, uh, what is it? 24 times three, 72 of you, right? There should be something like 70 something of you. The room is big enough so that there's space spacing. But it's just that you better be there early to settle all these little things. And then by five o'clock Wednesday, Blackboard, the exam will appear on the content page of the Blackboard. And you better make sure that your uh, uh, browser that you use allows for pop-up. You know what I mean by pop-up? Namely, you know, when you click on this, the Blackboard expects that you can uh, create a new window for the exam. But if your browser says, no, 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 everything has to be in uh, this and so on, you'll be in trouble, all right? Is there a short response? Well, I, I'll come to the nature of the questions in a minute. But So you better make sure that your uh, uh, browser enables you because I've had comments from people that say, oh, you know, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And it doesn't work because of your browser. And be ready to have uh, Firefox or uh, Chrome if you're using Edge. I use Edge all the time, but uh, when necessary, I have used Chrome. So in any way, just be ready. And then the other thing is, the number of charges, I'm told, our ML3 is not that modernized. Yeah, the exam will be on Blackboard. Uh, I just want to come back to the practical aspect. Our ML3, the Wi-Fi is good. They have uh, made it so that the bandwidth is good, so that there is no download issues. But you should not expect that every seat you have has a uh, an outlet for you to plug in your charger. Other schools I've been at, oh, for every seat in the auditorium, in the learning center, they have a plug outlet for you so that you can just plug in. But City College is not that, you know, I guess, rich, if you would like to call it, or endowed in that sense. So it is not yet at that level. Therefore, you may not be able to find one. Or if you find one, then somebody else cannot use that same outlet because you already uh, plugged in. So the best bet is to make sure that your laptop is fully charged before you come in, before you go to school. Make sure that your laptop is fully charged because then the exam itself is only an hour and 15 minutes. So you should be able to do it. All right. So I'm giving you the practical aspects of it because it can be quite frustrating. You say, I am now my battery is running out and I, what do I do? And nobody can help you unless you bring your own supercharger. And there are these devices, you know, the supercharger that you can buy, that you can then bring with you and then you can plug in your laptop to that supercharger. It's a portable supercharger. All right, so now, question. It is all on Blackboard and the questions are all one at a time. You go on to the content and then you will see the exam will be there. Then you click on it and it will now open on the new window. And on this new window, it will then appear as question number one. Now, my, the questions that I have, they are all in blocks. So you have random block one, 
random block two, random block three, and so on. I forgot how many random blocks there are, but altogether there will be 15 questions because some blocks may have four questions, some blocks may have three questions, but in any case, the total number of questions is 15, so that you have five minutes per question. The questions will appear one at a time. There is no backtracking and the questions will be randomized and the numbers in each question, whether it is uh, three volts or uh, 7.35 volts, it will be all different between you and your neighbor and your friend next door and so on. It is all randomized so that you cannot, you know, I guess, coordinate. And the other thing is, within this random block, the order in which the questions come up is not the same for everybody. It, that's why they call it random block, randomized, even within the block, so that it may have been the first question that appears in my block, but my friend may have gotten it as uh, question number six in a different order in his block, all right? Then, when it says that this random block, and I'll say each question will have, oops. When I say each question has, let's say, or this random block has, let's say, four questions, and I will say two multiple answers and two calculated formulas. Then, when you see yours as a multiple answer question, it is one where it is multiple choice, where I have four ways of saying what the answer is. For example, you know, like in the earlier one we have here, uh, things like, uh, you know, let's say we take this formula, right? And I know I am good at confusing you. The correct formula maybe should have been this. But when I give you four choices, some of them I have a pi missing, some of them I have a two upstairs, some of them I have an I, a mu, R down, I don't know, plus sign, minus sign. I, I am uh, known to be one who is able to confuse you. But you, you got the right idea. You say, gee, I know this is a question that involves blah, 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 whatever concept on the electric field, on the, the, the strength of the electric field, on the potential difference, you know, and therefore I now know which formula to use. And I now say out of A, B, C, D, out of the three or four or six choices, it is this one. And now you will then choose. You click on only one. You do not click on all four. Because you say, hey, if I click on all four, at least I get one quarter right. Blackboard will say wrong, and I will tell my grader to say, yes, do not give anybody any credit if they click more than one. You're supposed to click on only the one answer, and if that one answer is right, then you get full credit. If that one answer is wrong, sorry, you don't get credit. All right, so that would be for the multiple answer question. But then there's also calculated formula. And for calculated formula, well, then you have to, the same situation. It may be about the coil. Well, for this exam, magnet, magnetic field is not involved. So chapter 20 is not involved. So it is all, you know, capacitors, resistors, and the uh, equipotential surfaces, and the uh, electric potential, electric potential energy, Coulomb's law, you know, that kind of thing. All of those, you will now, given that it is this distance away, given that I have point charges that are at the four corners of uh, such and such arrangement, what is the net electric field? Well, you will then be able to, yeah, do it yourself and in the right units, right? And you will then be able to say, yeah, it is, uh, you know, such and such. And 
when you now give the answer, the blackboard will say, the question will say, give the answer to three significant figures in scientific notation to three significant figures, let us say. And now you did the calculation, you have your calculator, and man, your calculator gave you five significant figures, and so you wrote down, it is 3.14159. Blackboard will say, wrong. Even if it is really correct, if you were to round it off to three significant figures. You understand what I'm saying? It, let's say it should have been 3190, but you wrote it as 3187. Well, if the answer was to be three significant figures, Blackboard expects 3190, but you wrote down 31, uh, what is it? Uh, 3187. Now, it is okay if I were to grade it, but Blackboard says no. So I asked the grader to look over all the Blackboard uh, scores and now give you partial credit. Partial in the sense that you should have rounded it off to three significant figures, but you didn't, but your answer actually is correct. So maybe instead of 10 points, you only get seven points. All right. So the blackboard you just have to be careful now somebody said how does blackboard and uh, accept scientific notation the way it accepts it is 3.19 times 10 to the 2 it accepts it as 3.19 e2 the exponent 2 is in the excel notation all right so if it is 3.19 times 10 to the minus 2, yeah, that's right. If it is 3.19 to minus 2, then it is uh, 10 to the minus 2, then it is 3.19 e minus 2. You better learn the notation, okay? So for Blackboard, it's very fussy, and you better make sure. And the other thing is, Blackboard doesn't know what units. If let's say you say it is 3.19 e minus 2 uh, v volts per meter, v slash m, Blackboard will say, what is v? What is m? I don't know. It only looks for 3.19 e minus 2. The grader would then say, yeah, you know, uh, at least this. Uh, uh, you know, this person has the right units. And so there may be some partial credit. I have not yet uh, gone into the actual ones because it depends on the situation. But anyway, just be aware that you better be sure Blackboard is quite fussy. And there are questions where they don't say in terms of significant figures. Instead, they say it in terms of yeah, you can include the units, but Blackboard will not give you credit for the units. You can you can say V slash M, V slash M2, M squared, and so on. It wouldn't know because Blackboard only looks for the number when it is told to look for the answer. All right? Professor? Yeah. Can you allow us to backtrack because you know like we will be separated like distance so there is no chance of uh, like cheating and also there will be T so there is yeah. like no chance of teaching, uh, like cheating but like if we get stuck in one question there is a limited time so we will be focusing on that and we will be wasting time for other calculations so it has been like I have been facing that problem since like two or three so is it possible like you know because we have limited time and 15 questions. So if we get, if it's, there is like no backtracking, we will. If the, I don't I don't know question number three, I will be stuck in the in the three, and like there will be less time for the other questions. Yeah, I know. I have not uh, sort of uh, had experience with people backtracking because the question is, if you backtrack, do you backtrack all the way? You know, questions appear one at a time. Do you not backtrack? You know, 
uh, all the way to the question seven before i don't know and if i at this point mess around with that just like i messed around with uh, wiley plus and there were all the issues with uh, many people that say that uh, homework 19 they could not even do it you know i'm i'm i understand your uh, it's it's a difficult situation if i say now backtrack i do not have experience with backtrack does backtrack now say just one at a time you backtrack or do you now go tick 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 or is it the same as i download the whole thing to begin with if i download the whole thing to begin to begin with then it is hard to control you know it's easy to uh, to text each other it's hard to control so i i would still my given the circumstances my advice is you know you have five minutes use that five minutes to actually first look and say what's the concept is this talking about electric field or is this talking about electric potential you remember the difference between the electric field and electric potential right because the electric field is the one with respect to which you can form when you multiply by q0 electric field then you get the the force but the electric field by itself ah you can now from it get this concept of electric potential and then the electric potential the units are in terms of the volts so if you now look at this question and ask yourself is this about electric potential is this about electric potential difference and then knowing that it is electric potential i see that i have a set of formulas and now does this question reuse formula number five or whatever the formula is and then i will use it so you spend time thinking about the concept and then you go and work it out and i'm not making the test so complicated each question that it would take you you know all of uh, 10 minutes to figure it out it should be one where you now say I recognize the concept and though therefore I know this is uh, chapter 20 or this is chapter what is it uh, 19 or chapter 17 or something that I know and if it is chapter 17 oh it is uh, what is the linear superposition if it is the uh, uh, Doppler effect oh I know what formulas to use in Doppler effect if i want to know what is the sound you know velocity i know where to look the formula for sound velocity all right so what you should do is to just say what concept and then go into it now if given that you are able to do and by the way you should keep notes for yourself you say oh for the doppler one uh, this is the formula you, you have used and for this one you have, this is the formula you have used if you have already done you know if, if you took not that long a time you can then go second attempt within the 75 minutes and second attempt will be again randomized and you'll be given the highest score based on whether it's the first attempt or the second attempt is the highest score thank you professor yeah i i mean i understand if it were live it would be different everybody has already the exam printed out and then you will have to write out your answer within a box that i circle on the test and then i tell the the grader only look at what you say within that box you can use all of the paper this side that side to do all your scratching no cheat sheets available all the relevant formulas are already given for the final and then 
it's uh, one where the grader only looks at what you say inside the formula, in, inside the box. Somebody had a question I couldn't catch. Oh, this thing about being logged out. Yeah. Uh, when you click on, let's say it, uh, it's a multiple choice and it is A, B, C, D, and you already uh, chose B, let us say, but you forgot to punch the submit button, Blackboard will not know it. The Blackboard will accept your exam. Uh, I did not ask Blackboard to cut off everybody exactly at seven uh, at uh, six fifteen. You have a certain grace period. But if you take five minutes after that to finish, uh, Blackboard keeps a record. And when I enter your raw score, and I see that you took five minutes, I will say, eh, uh, I, 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 I don't know what I would do, but I would just say, eh. you understand what I'm saying? The Blackboard would not cut you off Blackboard will just put you as late, L-A-T-E. And then when I enter, finally download onto my uh, spreadsheet, I will know that this one was late and it will say how late it was. If it is five minutes late, but if it is just one minute late, okay, uh, I, I would say, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to be that, uh, you know, strict but i cannot tell you five minutes okay ten minutes yeah i will not do that all right there was some other question uh, somebody and as i said uh it is uh up to homework 20. So you use the homework twin, uh, you know, all the homeworks as exercise in order to get a sense of the kind of questions, but they are not the same as the one that would be on the test. I'm not taking homework, uh, you know, 19 dash uh, point 10 or point 0.5 and then put them on the blackboard. I'm not that type of a professor. But I will take the situation and now say, what is now the, whatever is the electric field or what now is the, uh, the resistance? What now is the capacitance uh, equivalent for this or that, all right? Professor? Yes. I had a question um, about the second attempt for the exam. Will right. it only give us like the questions that we got wrong and we have to do them again? Or will it give us the whole test again? No. <laughs> the blackboard is, uh, it gives you the whole test again. So that's why you better keep your own notes. You know, you already took the first attempt. So you you know for Doppler shift, it, you, you use this equation for, uh, I don't know, resistance. You gave, you use this, you know, formula, right? So then when it comes out, it will be randomized. So the question number one from your first test may now be question number seven in the second test. They are the same set of questions, but in a different order with different numbers. I mean, in a way, Blackboard is really so very uh, fussy and so on. It will be the same set of questions but in a different order and with different numbers. So that previously it was, uh, you know, five ohms and seven ohms and 10 ohms. Now it can be 3.7 ohms and 6.3 ohms and so on. So it's the same formula, but different numbers and different order. So different questions, uh, can you somebody say it again? What was the question? The question so different was questions. different. Huh? 
what was your question? The question was so different questions since we we have um to do the redo the questions. Yeah, it is different. It is <laughs> same question but different order and with different numbers. So question number one, let's say, was on Doppler effect on your test, but then the second attempt, the Doppler effect one may be uh, question number seven. And then it may ask you with different numbers, you know, like uh, the frequency was, uh, you know, uh, 200 hertz and uh, so on and so forth. So that it is, looks like totally different, but it's actually the same question, but in a different order and a different set of numbers. I don't know how else to explain. So the formula will be same for the question, but only the value will be different, right? Right, because the, because the formula was addressing the particular concept that they are asking, you know, like what is the new frequency or something, right? And then you say, ah, but I know that this is, first of all, Doppler shift. And am I giving all the answers already that uh, you now know which formula to use? And therefore, it is a new answer because you told me it is a new frequency, you know, it's... Uh, whatever, moving with different velocity. Professor, so do we see our score after the first attempt so we can determine if we want to take the second attempt? Uh, no, you do not know that you have done uh, you know, all the answers correctly. No, it does not tell you. That's why I say it's better to do first attempt, but slowly, well. Although I know in, in uh, there have been times when many people, they just go blah, blah, blah through one and then they do two slower. I don't know. Some people use that strategy. But if, I, if it were me, I would just spend on the first attempt more careful. Um, professor, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so for accessing your slides and our notes during the test, can we use our iPad along with the computer? I guess so. I, I have not uh, <laughs> I have not talked to other professors about that, but I think so. I mean, I, I guess so. But you cannot put your iPad out so that your, your friend at the back can see it while you're doing it. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. It's just going to be in front of me because all my notes are in my yeah. iPad. And right, right, right. I mean, it's it's like you need your own uh, your own uh, worksheets, right? And uh, if you are good with iPad, then you do it on your iPad. I don't know, but if you start putting it on the side, I will tell the proctor if he sees anybody putting the thing on the side so that the people at the back can see. I will tell the proctor to now remove your iPad or at least you know tell you no. Okay. Now, somebody say, what is this same time? I didn't catch that. Uh, they're asking if we will have extra time for the second attempt. I say it's all within the same test time. No, it's within the same time limit. So if you, there are some people that just download the first attempt, da, 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 and then they work, spend time on the second attempt. So that's how some people do it. I, I, I don't know. That is up to you. Uh, now, somebody had a question. Victoria, what's your question? So it's like didn't... when you grade the questions, do you take the highest grade for each question separately or highest attempt of the exam as a whole? No, it is the highest attempt as a whole. It's not the highest of the question comparing the first and the second attempt. It is first attempt, you did, 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 did it, and you got, let's say, 70. And now second attempt, it is da, 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 and now you got 90. Based upon whatever you do on the second attempt, then it is 90 is your raw score. So professor, if we do the steps correctly, but when calculating, if we do the answer, if we put the answer wrong, so we don't get any partial credit, right? Well, no, no, that's where this this thing about multiple answer and calculated formula is in the way you're getting partial credit because the multiple answer and the calculated formula, they are on the same situation. So 
if you got your formula right, but then for some reason, your calculator formula, uh, you missed, uh, you know, a minus sign or something, or you got your calculator input the number a little bit scrambled, you didn't get the answer, you didn't get the numerical answer, but you got the formula right, that's your partial credit in a way. That's the way I arranged it. So multiple answer and calculator formula are on the same situation. Are you following this now? Yes, thank you, Professor. Any other comments? And you better have your uh, vaccination, whatever, certification ready so that you can enter. Okay, so uh, what? 15 questions overall. Yeah, that's right. 15 questions. And you... All right. So, have a good night and good day and uh, Wednesday also. But as I say, show up at Marshak Room 3 10 minutes before 5 o'clock. Okay? All right, so see you. I will be online chatting on Wednesday. Okay, bye. Let me know. Bye.